Joining us again on WarChant.com is Bryant McFadden, FSU great, two-time Super Bowl champ and football analyst for CBS Sports and BMAC. We're talking off the record there early. Love that backdrop there, man. That's a fantastic man cave back there. You got your FSU gear. I know you showed me your Pittsburgh gear, Cardinals. That's some neat stuff, man. Yeah, I even got some high school, so it's almost like a, just a, my, my journey. Uh, you know, growing up playing football, I got high school, I got, uh, you know, college, senior role, and, of course, all my NFL jerseys, so... That's good stuff, man. You can follow him at, uh, like I said, CBS Sports, and it's BMAC underscore Sports Talk. Is that right? On Twitter. Yes, sir. You got some neat features going on right now, some NFL. You're profiling some guys, doing some stuff. So it's neat to follow BMAC on there and underscore Sports Talk and get kind of a rundown there. And we're, we're you and I are both can't wait for football season. We're getting there slowly. Here we are in the middle of June. But uh, let's talk about linebackers today, BMAC. And, and in my opinion, Probably after offensive line, maybe the next most disappointing unit on the on the field last year for Florida State. I'm going to go through some general numbers here for you, and it's not like a specific stat really for the linebackers, but overall number uh, 80 in total defense, 90 in scoring defense, 100 in forcing turnovers. I mean, you're at Florida State, you got to be forcing more turnovers than being in the bottom tier of that. You know, you look at the pro football focus grades we're going to put up for you here. Dontavious Jackson did pretty good this year. It was a number 155 overall to 77.6 grade on pro football focus. And uh, we had other guys. Emmett, Emmett Rice was in there, didn't grade real well. He was hurt. And you had a lot of other issues there. But, BMAC, when you look on film with those linebackers in 2018, what jumped out of you? What, what were they not doing well that they should be doing? Uh, they just uh, were not attacking. Um and when I mean when I say that, just coming downhill, you know, finding the ball, attacking the football, uh, sometimes not being in the correct gap. Now, a lot of that could be uh, uh, to, uh, to directed towards the front because the front and the linebackers, they go hand in hand as far as being gap sound. So sometimes if a defense alignment sticks his head in the wrong gap, that can kind of screw up the linebackers. But that's something that we saw that I saw personally just watching the game, not playing with the right gap integrity, not attacking the football, and not not being violent enough. And I think when you look at this defense a year ago, we saw growing pains because a lot of these players were so familiar with one particular scheme. And then Harlan Barnett comes in with his staff, ch- kind of changing things for the most part. And you saw it took time for the the linebackers, the defense in totality to really understand and get adjusted to what they were supposed to do based on what they've been doing throughout their time there in Tallahassee. So we saw growing pains, but I can say this. I think for the most part, the defense played well. They just could not sustain that production, Gene. In the beginning of the most ball games, I mean, the defense came out with a fury. I mean, they were flying to the football, but because of the lack of depth, Because of the lack of rotation with players coming in and out, you saw gradually throughout ball games the defense kind of tapered down. And it didn't help at all because our offense wasn't consistent. Our offense wasn't generating positive yards. They weren't using the clock. And when I mean when I say using the clock, not just time-wise, using the clock by sustaining drives. That can do wonders for defenses when you're playing. In college football, most teams on both sides of the football, they're playing almost 80 to 90 plays. That's a lot of plays, but our defense was on the football field a lot, and because of that, they got they, they got tired. They, they got worn out. So hopefully in year two in this new scheme with Coach Barnett, I believe we'll, we'll, we will see more consistent play. I, will, I, I believe we will see that violent style of football, especially for the linebackers that we've grown accustomed to seeing at Florida State. And this team, defensively, they should be more productive. Along those lines, I saw a stat that uh, has to shake up any defensive player because <clears throat> you're talking about how poorly the offense played and how that affects the defense. And I think it was one of those Athlon preseason magazines. They said in 130 teams in FBS, FSU was 130 in defensive field position. That means they were put in the worst position of any defense in the FBS when they had to defend on the field. And that's not, if you're a defensive player, defensive staff, that's not what you want. No, I mean, not helping you. defending a short field happens throughout the game of football but you cannot expect for me to de- defend a short field 60 70 percent of the times we're on the football field and we saw that because of turnovers we saw that because of sacks we saw that because of negative plays from our offense our defense had to trot on the football field the morale already down 
and now trying to, to, to only defend a uh, 20 to 30 yards of grass before a team opposing offense and get into a uh, uh, scoring range, that's tough to do, especially when you don't have the depth. We did not have the depth, especially at the linebacking uh, uh, unit, Gene. I think that was the position that lacked the most depth out of all the units defensively. And that goes back to, I think, what the underlying issue here is, BMAC, is really the talent base of that position because we talked last time about defensive backs loaded with talent. Those guys had seven, if I remember right, seven rivals, 100 members, two five-stars. In the last four years, the linebackers have signed one rivals, 100 member, and that was Amari Gaynor, who was a freshman who sat out last season with an injury. So they had no elite recruits at that linebacker group. And to your point on depth, they had a couple injuries and they just didn't recruit very good in terms of numbers the last few years either. So that really goes back to it. Are you seeing kind of like maybe, and we're going to talk about in a minute, I think Raymond Woody's done a really good job and he's infused that unit. I think there's going to be better talent in the next couple of years. But do you not see the Florida State level of talent on the whole at that unit that you saw back in your days and during the Jimbo Fisher era? No, not right now I don't. But I want to get some things, you know, clear. Because I know a lot of people get caught up in these stars. You know, a lot of these guys are five stars and four stars and things like that. Whenever you sign to a power five school, a, a true blue blood school when it comes to football, you're good. You might not have the accolades like some of these other elite high school prospects, but you're good. And I think most importantly for us, we have to do better in developing the players that we currently have. Because how many times have we seen five stars come in and not live up to the billing? And you may see a three star come in and just exceed expectations. Prime example, a different player, but he's an offensive player, Devontae Freeman. Devontae mm-hmm. Freeman came to Florida State, only a three star guy. Wasn't considered one of the best players at his position, yet and still wasn't even one of the best players in the state of Florida. But came to Florida State. As an individual, he really put forth the effort and he worked and they were able to develop him. That's what we have to do now. A year ago, no question, the depth was a big time concern going into the first year with Willie Taggart at the linebacking core. Also, when the injuries came apart, came, came into play, it was tough to really jump over that hurdle. But we need to find a way to develop these players and see what players do well, what they don't do well. And therefore, that can dictate how you call the game and the flow of the game. And just to throw out that talent thing, how it's going to improve. I mean, we're going to talk about Jaleel McRae in a minute, who really blew up in the spring. You know, that was a that was a Raymond Woody sign signee. We're going to have you know you're going to have healthy Amari Gaynor this year in there. He's a big time player. Kalen Deloach is coming in, and already for the 2020 class, he's got three four star recruits coming in there. So I think the depth in that talent base is going to improve over the next couple of years. So I think that'll be uh, that'll change a little bit. Now some of the BMAC. Here's where you can be a good expert for us and help us out here. Florida State in the spring, we found out they're switching to a lot of 3-4. Four, four. We'll see how much. It seems to me it's going to be that's going to be the primary formation for that defensive scheme. With Mike Tomlin, everywhere you went in the NFL, you played in a 3-4 base. So tell Florida State fans a little bit about what is that going to bring to the table for Florida State? What are the challenges also for making that switch from a 4-3 to a 3-4? Well, if it's done the right way, Gene, that defense can be magnificent. Uh, my entire professional career, I was a part of a 3-4 scheme. I played under one of the best, well-respected coaching minds in the National Football League in Dick LeBeau. He was a guy that created the fire zone concepts, concepts that are ran th- throughout any level of football. But the most important thing that Dick LeBeau used to emphasize to us was that bad defenses don't have bad personnel. Using the personnel in a bad way creates bad defenses, if you understand that logic. And that makes a lot of sense. So transitioning to what we're trying to do now with Florida State, if they're able to use the personnel correctly, get guys in the ideal position in this new 3-4 hybrid type of defense, they will cause a lot of havoc for opposing offenses. Number one is because... Most college offenses, they don't see 3-4 schemes. I can even go back to when I was at Florida State. The only team that I remember consistently ran a 3-4 defense was Virginia. Virginia had pretty good personnel to do so, but they did not execute that defense extremely well, especially the front. The linebackers, they had ideal linebackers. I mean, uh, Ahmad Brooks, Parham, they had some talented guys. 
uh, also Long, he came along right when I left. But in totality, they did not have the front. And if you think about what the, we did against Virginia, we ran the ball down their throat. We had an outstanding offensive line, the likes of Milford Brown, Montre ha- uh, Holland, um, um, Alex Barron, Ray Willis, Todd Williams. I mean, you can go on and on and on with some of the outstanding offensive linemen that were there in Tallahassee when I was there. And what we did against Virginia was we went right down the teeth of their defense because we felt their personnel could not uphold the standard for four quarters. But if you have a defense a la Alabama with the personnel in the right direction, a la Georgia with the personnel in the right direction, then you start to see success going in their favor. Alabama runs a 3-4 defense. They've been able to recruit the personnel. And ideal, they're getting coached up properly. Their defense has always been the creme de la creme when it comes to college defenses. Georgia, Kirby Smart, even before Kirby Smart, remember Jeremy Pruitt, mm-hmm. who used to be in Tallahassee, by the way of Alabama, he was ahead of that defense when Mark Rick was there before he became the head coach at Tennessee. They ran that same scheme. Those teams are successful because they do a wonderful job in getting personnel in the right situation to be successful I think that's that's the only that's my biggest concern for us with this 3-4 scheme or the hybrid making sure we have the ideal personnel where they need to be where they can be the most successful I mean if we did this a year ago Brian Burns would have been a heck of a player as an outside linebacker being able to rush standing up using his speed his athleticism he's athletic enough to drop in coverage he's not a liability when it comes to that because when it comes to doing that he would have been the ideal outside linebacker now who will transition into that role? Because one thing about three, four defenses, Gene, and this is the last thing I'm hit on with this, the outside linebackers are probably the most important player in the three, four scheme outside of the nose guard. And in Pittsburgh, our outside linebackers were basically defensive linemen that were super athletic. Joey Porter, 6'4", 255, 260, can run four five, can pass rush strong as an ox. Uh, 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 Greg Lloyd, I mean, uh, Lamar Woodley. Our outside linebackers were the catalyst for our defense, along with the anchor, which is the nose guard. Those are the two most important positions on a 3-4. The outside linebackers, because they have to rush like defensive ends, but they have to be able to be uphold the standard in coverage. And the nose guard, he's the anchor. He's the guy that keeps my inside backers clean. We had Casey Hampton, who's been the ideal nose guard for quite some time because he was 360, strong as a hot, mm-hmm. and he did not mind just being a stop gap for the linebackers to flow to the football. He wasn't a penetrator, he was more so of a stop gap. So if you can find an ideal nose guard and two outside backers, you'll be successful. It's gonna be interesting to see, like you said, how that personnel works out. You got uh, Robert Cooper, AKA the trench monster, will probably take on that role and he's dropped some good weight. He's getting into uh, an acceptable range. We'll see if he's able to do that. And then one of the position changes, Leonard Warner has moved into the kind of that, that hybrid fourth uh, defensive end linebacker position. So we'll see if he fits there. But again, a lot of question marks going into that defensive scheme. I want to talk about some of the personnel specifically, and Dontavious Jackson, who's kind of the undisputed leader of that unit, uh, has been a starter the last couple of years. And one thing I, we're going to show his numbers right here in Pro Football Focus is a thing I like to see, BMAC, because we, we fall into the trap as media sometimes. We expect too much of these kids. You talk about all the stars coming out of high school. Um, fans do it all the time. But you want to see improvement out of a kid. And this, if you look at the numbers, Great at 61% in 2016, 643 in 2017, 77% this this past season. So he's showing that gradual improvement. Now he's the undisputed leader. What do you see out of Don Tavis and what he, his his senior season here? What are we going to see out of him this year? I mean, you hit on improvement uh, from year one to currently now going into his fourth year. We've seen a guy that has improved. I think outside of the improvement from what we've seen, his ability to get in better shape. He came in, he was a bit chubby. He was like the Kyle Lowry of the linebacking core, a little, a little chubby guy. Uh, but now if you look at his, his profile shot from his freshman year to now, you can see the transformation going in the right direction as far as taking care of his body and now being serious about the business of being successful as a college football player. He's the alpha male of the group. I like Don Tavius because he plays with emotion. He's passionate about the game, and now he's starting to learn the game. What I saw last year based on how he started the year compared to how he finished it, it was night and day. He had some of his best football games towards the latter part of 2018. Uh, Boston College, uh, Notre Dame, I think he finished with double-digit tackles Mm -hmm. in both ball games. He was flying around to the football. He was a magnet. 
as far as tackles. I mean, he was getting to the ball, and he has that athleticism. So I'm excited about Don uh, Dontavious based on how he finished 2018 going into 2019. He is the alpha male of that group. He is the vocal leader. He is the emotional leader. And it's imperative for him to lead by example because he is the, the senior of the group, to say the least, as far as experience and as far as age. He's one of our best defensive players, and a lot of things that he does kind of go unnoticed, but the heart and grit and, and toughness he plays with is something that I always see, and I think he has to be the ultimate leader for our defense because when talk, we, were, we were just talking about the depth issues we had a year ago. There's a good chance this depth will be better, but the, they will be so young. I mean, there's a good chance, man, we might see two or three freshmen get an opportunity to play. And it's up to Dontavious and some of the other guys to really lead these guys by example. But I'm excited for him. I think he was second in tackles, mm -hmm. uh, around with 70 plus tackles. I think he was second in tackles for loss. I would love to see him improve on that number, and I think he will. And the last thing I will say about my excitement for DJAC, year two in this defense, now he understands what the coaches expect from him. Now he understands what the coaches expect from expects from the defense in all three levels. I think that would do wonders for his growth, starting the season on fire, staying healthy, and being able to sustain that level of play, because this is his last hoorah. This is the final lap of the 4x4 for, for, Don, for, for DJ. He better make sure this lap is a hell raiser. <laughs> Organized chaos is what we need to see from him. This is what we need to see from this defense. I mean, he's a fourth leg on that 4x4. Four four. He will not get any do-overs. This He can't hit the reset button. So what he puts on film this season, he will have to embrace it and own up to it because, of course, he has aspirations of playing in the National Football League, and I believe he will do so. Next thing I want to talk about is my favorite position change, probably of anything that happened in the spring, and that is Hamza Nasraldine will be moving from that safety position to the linebacker position. Why well, I love this because it, from the beginning you saw this kid, you talked about being aggressive, having that attitude. He will knock your you-know-what in the dirt. He's done that consistently back there. He's been a, you look at his grades here, we're showing you right now, very solid tackling. He's always been a good tackler. Where he struggled a little bit is in coverage in that secondary. Wow. You know, but that's the thing. He at linebacker, he's not going to be covering those four four wide receivers. So I mean he's a guy who'll probably be a good coverage linebacker, guy who's aggressive. He's a 4'4 four, four guy, 6'4", about 220 pounds. I love that move to linebacker for Hamson. I think that can be his future. I was always questioning why Hamza was covering guys in the slot anyway. Um, extremely rangy, but he plays tall. And that's the wrong attribute you want to have for a guy in the secondary playing tall. You don't want to play like a stop sign because you're not bending. <laughs> and if you're playing like a stop sign, you don't have the leverage and, and, and the uh, uh, foundation to be able to move with the, some of these smaller pass catches, and that, that's what we saw uh, last season. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying about the personnel, having, person, having the personnel in, in better positions to be successful and making this move to like that star linebacker where he will be asked to be in space to cover people, but not necessarily slot receivers, more so tight ends and running backs. He would do a better job in doing so because – his skill set fits covering those type of guys better than covering wide receivers or slots or, or slot guys. Then the tackle, you talked about it. He's a he's a he's an angry man. I love it. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, he's an angry guy. You want your defenders to be angry or be able to hit that angry switch and turn it off to be polite. On the football field, he's an angry guy and he flies around. So I'm excited for this change as well, because he will bring a type of energy to the linebacking core based on how he plays. I mean, he's a guy that can be a tone setter. You know, sometimes when you look at situations as far as games, uh, uh, any level of football game, you look for a guy that can be a tone setter, that can get the crowd to stand up. He can be that guy. He just has to be able to understand now he will be called to take on more blockers than what he's done so far in his collegiate career. But the game is not a physical game like it was when I played. You don't see a lot of eye formations. You don't see a lot of strong, weak eye, things like that. More so it's a finesse game implemented with some downhill running. He should be okay. I think this is a big move. I, I, we, I know we talked about the secondary 
uh, a week or so ago when I talked about how excited I was about Taylor moving to that inside role, more of a safety mm-hmm. type role. I'm just as excited about Hansom moving down to the linebacker area because, first of all, we need that type of spark. Secondly, his skill set will help him be successful playing in that box area as a linebacker. And lastly, I mean, we need depth. We need we need to add bodies, and I think he will be a quality starter. And 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 you know, D. Jack has to help him and bring him along because, of course, Hanson never really played the linebacker position in the collegiate level. But yeah, I'm excited about him. He's ang- angry, angry Hanson is what I call him. <laughs> I've come Hansen. up with a nickname for him. That that sounds good. The last guy I want to just specifically, we'll, we'll throw down some of the other ones I want to talk about, just because you talk about being excited about a player. I don't think there's anybody's been more excited about a player coming out of spring practice this year than Jaleel McCray. The true freshman has come in. He had 11 tackles in the spring game, had two picks in the scrimmage before that, and just any player you talk to, the coaches, they just they grin from ear to ear when you bring up his name, what he brings to the table. We talked about Raymond Woody's recruiting. It's improving, bringing in the talent. And guys like this, because BMAC, I, I think since Tovin, has there been a star linebacker guy? You go, that's a star player. Has there been anybody since Tovin on this, on this team? I mean, we need a guy like that. Maybe Jaleel can be that guy that they need back there. You know, Gene, you covered the game for quite some time. You know, you covered Florida State for a long, long time. You've been around a lot of outstanding, talented players. And the thing I like about Jaleel is that when you see him play, when you see him practice, you instantly say he has that it factor. Yeah. And the it factor is a guy that seems to be in the right position all the time. Clearly, mentally, he's not where he needs to be because he was an early enrollee and he was learning on the fly. But his ability ability to be where he's supposed to be is just a natural instinct. He has the it factor. Some players don't. Some players do. I mean, I've seen it all the time. It's a guy that, you know, on the National Football League level, you might draft a rookie and he don't even know the defense, but he's always picking off passes. Or, or as a pass catcher, he's always catching key third down uh, conversions or uh, touchdowns. He just has the it factor. Now, when, you, when you're able to combine the knowledge that he eventually will get along with that it factor, he will be a superstar for us. He could potentially be a freshman All-American. Wow. The only concern would be, Gene, the opportunities. But when you have that it factor, Gene, you can make an impact in any facet in the ball game special teams wise running down kickoffs running down punts you might get six or seven snaps in a ball game those six or, uh, six or seven snaps potentially could be highlights it doesn't matter when it comes to the opportunities if he's able just to get on the football field he'll provide an impact i, I like what he's been doing he just stays around the football he, he, that's a quality skill set to have funny you brought that up the two guys had it factor for me on defense and you we talked about him before Akeem Dent was one of those guys I mean right off the way first practice you're like okay this kid gets it he he's got the instinct for the game you're right with Jaleel's the same thing going there a couple other linebackers I just want to bring out I don't know if you had any impressions Adonis Thomas comes in as a senior he's got some experience I think whether he starts or whether he's one of those first guys off the bench gives you some quality there Emmett Rice, who has battled injuries his whole career now here's a guy who can fly from sideline to sideline just has not been able to stay healthy and then Amari Gaynor, who was a highly regarded guy coming and set out last year. He actually led both defenses and tackles in the spring game with 13. So we finally saw what he can do when he's healthy. He's out there. He's that solid, consistent tackler out there you need. So, I mean, we're talking about if they can stay healthy with some of these guys, it gives them a little bit more depth this year that they didn't have. Yeah, let me hit on Thomas first and foremost. Uh, signed with Alabama and then mm-hmm. transition, uh, transferred to Florida State. 6'4", 235. My issue with Thomas is that he does not play 6'4", 235. When you're that big, you got to be a bully on the football field. You got to consistently bully people. You got to play. I talked about, we talked about handsome playing angry. Thomas needs to have that same mentality. He has to have that same DNA. I'm going to bully you. I'm going to take your lunch away from you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Coach Andrew used to tell us all the time, he don't want to coach soft people. And I'm not saying Thomas is soft, but Coach Andrew used to make that analogy based on what he's seen on the football field. you got to consistently deliver the blow. If you're that big, show me. And be an intimidator. That's how you have to play the game of football, especially playing the linebacker, uh, linebacker position. And this is his last hurrah. Like you said, he's a senior. Either you go take it or you don't. This is it. This is the final lap 
for Thomas in that four by four. He will not get any do overs. Don't know exactly if he will be a starter, but any opportunity he gets to get on the football field, be serious about your business and go take it. Go take somebody lunch. Don't ask for it. Go take it. He has to be a bouncer. He got to be throwing people out of the club. And I didn't see that all the time. I didn't see that. And Emmett Rice, Emmett potentially could be that Telvin Smith type at the linebacker position, right? But he can't stay healthy. He can't stay healthy. Accountability is the best trait you can have, being accountable. Because if you're accountable, you're able to be involved in practice reps. You're able to be involved in getting experience. And we haven't seen that from Emmett since he signed on to Florida State. And because of that, he hasn't really picked up weight. He hasn't really picked up a lot of strength because he's always been dealing with some type of injury. I think if he is healthy, G, he's talented. He's a guy that has a knack for being around the football field, but we just haven't seen it. You know, we just haven't mm-hmm. seen it. So I pray that he is healthy because, unfortunately, it's hard to really – you can't control injuries. And you don't want to get hit with that injured guy label. You know what I mean? We saw that with George Campbell. Came in with a lot of hype, but never got an opportunity to really show his worth because he was always injured. And then when he was healthy, he was – behind the eight ball. You know what I mean? So I like Emmett. It just has to be healthy. Just hold your breath with Emmett. If he's healthy, I think he will provide a spark for us because he has that knack for being around the football. He's a tackling machine. I don't care nothing about how small he is. He just has that go get it factor. Like Telvin did. Remember, Telvin mm-hmm. only played around like 220 or 215. But you can tell because he loved the game of football. And then uh, who, and, and, and Garner. Who was the last Amari Amar Gaynor. Oh, Gainer, Gainer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gainer had a heck of a spring. I think Gainer should have a lot of confidence going into uh, fall camp. He's a local kid, highly uh, talented kid, um, but couldn't really crack the lineup last year. You talked about some of the injuries. He was hurt. Yeah, he sat out last year, yeah. And he sat out, too. But going in before he was injured, I'm, I was hearing he was having some you know, issues yeah. catching up yeah. on the system. Uh, but so far, when you watch him in the spring, you saw a guy that was – that knew what he was doing. And I think, too, the best thing for, for, for Amari was seeing the success that Jaleel was having. I, yeah, I think that point. was pushing. That was pushing Amari. Because guess what? When, when McCray came in, he was a talk of the town as far as the young, the young, the young defensive players, him and Dent. But then at the linebacker uh, unit, everybody was talking about McCray. Mm-hmm. And watching how Amari, uh, Amari just took the spring by a surprise – I felt like he saw the heat and the and, and the level of uh, uh, recognition that uh, McCray was getting, and he was like, you know what, I'm here also. And I think that's that's you know what, that's what we need competition. You know what I mean? When I played in the secondary, I played like my last few years. I played with Stanford Samuels, and then my senior year, uh, Leroy Smith, uh, Antonio Cromartie. We used to we used to compete against each other. Oh, I bet they don't catch any passes on me today. Or oh, I bet I don't give up. Uh, three third downs in this ball game. We used to compete against each other. They made it fun, but not to mention you didn't want to be last. You always wanted to be in the top of the charts when it came to allowing passes to your side. I think we started to see an internal competition between Amari and Jaleel, and it actually worked out well because both players played phenomenal. Yeah, two leading tacklers in the spring game, so they're already off to a nice little competition there. We'll see yeah. that. Hopefully that continues during the season. Yeah, You're absolutely right. On. So yeah, your final take on it, I, there's so many, we talked about all the, the, the personnel issues, the change of the 3-4, there's a lot of moving parts here, but you got to think on the whole, just because talent's a little bit better, depth's a little bit better, I think we're going to see some improvement, but, uh, but what do you think this linebacker unit, and your final thoughts on it, what do you think it's going to look like in 2019, B-Mac? Well, based on what we're expecting to see as far as the defense, could be a 3-4, could be a hybrid, could be a 4-3, depending on the situations. Number one, d is our guy. Uh, he is the best linebacker there in that unit. Uh, secondly, for me, that's where you have a toss-up. I mean, of course, Hansa will be there as that star linebacker. So those are the two ideal guys. I think Hansa, uh, Hansa will be the second starting linebacker. But now how do you determine the mm-hmm. third guy as far as will he be an edge rusher, stand-up guy? Or will he be another guy that could potentially be in the box? How do you see uh, uh, Coach Barnett and his staff handling uh, Amari? What, will he be an inside guy? Uh, of course, Adonis will be a backup, you know, inside guy to potentially DJ. 
You have Leonard, who you talked about, could be like that edge rusher. So I, I'm just I'm just in a wait and see situation when it comes to the other backers because personnel. How are they going to attack whoever it is we're playing? And for, of course, the first game is against Boise. So ideally, most offenses, Gene, you know, they come out in three wide receiver sets, uh, four wide receiver sets. So for us, it's mostly a nickel type of package defensively. And if we're in a nickel package. It's safe to say d and, and Hamza would be the two ideal starting linebackers. And everybody else can kind of flow in the rotation. And potentially, you know, you can have a guy like Leonard could be an a, a, a edge rusher. Or maybe you move some, some of the old defensive ends. Uh, 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 Robinson. Um, yep, and, uh, he, he played some there. Yeah, Robinson in there some. Uh, you, got, you got Dennis Briggs, a guy like that who was hurt, who probably isn't it can fit in that role. And, and what's his name? Con, 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 Conjo? Oh, Kando. Kando. But Kando, he's a little Kando. bigger. I think he may be that other defensive end, but he may be athletic enough. Really highly regarded guy. Five star guy coming in. A little bit bigger, though, two, in the 260 range. But, you know, if they can get him over there, too, maybe. Yeah, so you might either, you might see some of those guys that we've seen with their hand in the dirt standing up to be some type of edge rusher uh, in that sub package as far as nickel and dime. So I just wait and see. But I think the two ideal guys starting off with d um, and then um, Hansa will be the two starting linebackers, and then kind of seeing how the the formation will dictate based on what the offense gives you. Great stuff, B Mac. This is gonna be a lot of fun, man. You get me all excited. I can't wait for practice to start up. We still got about a month and a half to go before that thing kicks off. But uh, good stuff. And you can follow B Mac again, B Mac underscore Sports Talk, and catch his work at CBS Sports uh, all over the place, man. Great stuff. We'll do it again soon, B Mac. You take care, buddy. Uh, likewise.